I'm Dr. Michael DeTola. And I'm Megan Strong. And our Case of the Week, a faithful viewer, sends us his directions for making a quick and dirty custom tray. And the Japanese teen invents a toothbrush that would make both the ADA and the NRA very happy. And in Madrid, a dude on a Harley sneezes and makes his Spanish teeth fly. That and more on today's Chairside Live. Hello and welcome to episode 98 of Chairside Live. 98, were you just doing a Rick D's thing? Is that what you said for 98? <laughs> it's 98 D's Grease. No, oh. I remember that. I was I was referencing the old boy band 98 Degrees with Nick Lachey and his fellow members. Oh, shoot. I missed out on all those guys. Yeah. Well. I'm a huge Ro One Republic fan. Okay. I don't want to start an argument here, but them is my boys. I wasn't even a fan of 98 Degrees, actually. Um, but I just, that's what it made me think of. You were just aware of them. Yep. You knew they were there. Were yeah, they from Florida, like all those other ba boy bands? There's, <laughs> that, there's that one producer it's who like, like puts Florida together. And then yeah. like Ohio. Um, no, I'm not sure where they're from. I think, actually, that Ohio thing may be like remotely true. It might, I think they might have been like Midwest sort of a deal, East right. Coast, I'm not sure. Right. Well, I know Florida put out an awful lot of them. Too many. Too many. Too many. For, one's too many for me, but too many anyway. Well, we've got an interesting show for you today and a good case of the week. In fact, the case of the week was generated by something sent in by one of our loyal watchers having to do with what is the most difficult tooth to impress in the mouth and why. And he gives us his solution for this. In fact, let's take a look at that now. On this week's Case of the Week, we actually have a tip that's been sent in by friend of the show, Dr. Marshall Horowitz. And Marshall writes in and he said, Dr. Detola, what is the hardest tooth to impress and why? And I thought about it for a minute. I, I thought maybe it was like a Zen proverb, like what's the sound of one hand clapping? Uh, and but, but then I started to think about it and I really couldn't come up with an answer. And then he said, the answer is, the second molar and um, you know so whether it's the upper or the lower I think he's talking uh, a little more maybe about uppers than than lowers but probably both and he says you know uh, it's very difficult because with the patient lying back the material wants to run off the tooth and you can just miss it all together or get a pull in that area you'll see second molars that are displaced towards the buckle or the lingual and they'll start bumping into the side of stock trays and he he related a story about back in 1987 how he had taken five impressions on this one woman's uh, upper second molar over the course of two appointments and kept struggling with it and finally ended up using a an old Kerr product called Formatray to construct uh, an actual custom tray for her and on that next appointment he got it first time and it was perfect um, and so he would make some of these in batches at a time but uh, you know realized it was kind of an expensive way to do it and didn't want to make custom trays every time and then figured out a great easy modification that I wanted to share with you because this is what he's now able to do uh, and, and get impressions on second molars without missing it. So this is a quadrant tray that he orders from, um, from Patterson Dental. Um, it's, you know, there's a lot of plastic trays like this that you'll see um, with the slots on the side. And basically what, uh, what Marshall does, first of all, he hits it with a flame. And so he goes to Home Depot and gets a flame there because as he points out a flame's a flame you could order the link you know torch from Patterson but as he points out it's pretty expensive it's like 44 bucks and then there's a hazardous material shipping charge of $25 which if you go pick it up yourself at Home Depot I guess you could charge yourself that but you probably wouldn't so he heats up both portions uh, of the distal part of the tray and widens it as you can see here so if we've got a big fat you know, upper second molar, that's a big palatal cusp, there's room for that. If it's been displaced uh, out to the buckle, there's room for that too. So he widens the tray in the back after just softening it up with the torch. And then he adds some triad composite in the back and basically adds a stop to the back of it to hold the impression material in place. So if you filled this with impression material and the patient's laying on their back like this, we'll pretend that the patient, you know, is lying like this on top of this dental chair, so we put this into their mouth and the material does want to run out of the back because of gravity, including the syringe material or especially the syringe material we put on the tooth. And the heavy body might not do it as much, but it could have already run off the tooth by the time the heavy body gets in there. And so what Marshall has done is create his own little stop, his back of the tray right here, uh, if you will, to accommodate 
uh, whatever the patient has back there and hold the impression material in at the same time. And uh, that's a fantastic little idea. So he puts the triad back there and cures it. And uh, so within a couple minutes, you have a very cheap uh, custom tray, if you will, uh, for a second molar where you know that you're going to have fit. As you put it in, you get passive fit and this fits behind the second molar, and you know you're gonna be able to hold it in, in place, the material, and not get a pull uh, on that distal because of the fact that gravity's pulling that impression material down. So right now, we're designing some impression trays here at the lab, and you haven't seen any of these yet because these are just printed uh, 3D pieces right now. And we're trying to look for things that we would find desirable. You know, I like trays like this. If you're going to use a double arch tray that get a little taller in the front, that can hold more material up by the cuspids. Now, when Marshall sent his tray in, I started looking at ours going, hmm, what can we do to put something here on the back? But it's pretty difficult to do on a double arch tray because it's going to be bumping into something. And it's, it's really difficult to find enough room between the arches distal to the second molars to have anything else besides a thin bar. If you look at some of my other favorite trays. This is the uh, Quad Tray uh, Extreme from Clinician's Choice. I like this one because of how stiff it is and it's metal, but you also realize that it, it's the same thickness all the way forward, whereas if you look at the prototype tray, as the walls get taller as you come up here, we always want the cuspid impressed uh, anytime we're doing a double arch uh, technique like this so we can get some uh, lateral excursions once everything's articulated. And sometimes it's difficult here because you really have to stack up the material and it's kind of unsupported by the tray. So I like the stiffness, uh, but again, it's got that very thin distal bar to make sure the patients can get around it. Uh, Premier makes another uh, great T-Lock uh, triple tray. Triple tray, of course, is a brand name of Premier. And you can see that they've got these T-locks along here for the material to really lock into, which I think is fantastic. I mean, it's not like it falls out of the clinician's choice trays, but uh, especially when they're shipped and poured, uh, it might be poured multiple times if it's a polyvinyl impression that we want to get, you know, a couple solid models on or something. It's really nice to have these retention tees. Again, the plastic, obviously, a little more flexible, but if you use a very heavy body material that the whole unit itself can be rigid when it's set, but again, kind of that thin distal bar that we're always up against. And I like a little bit of play. You can see some play here in the Premier tray. And there's a little bit in the prototype too for the deep overbites. I like something a little thicker on the lingual to help keep the patient's tongue away as, they, as it goes to explore what we've just kind of squirted uh, onto that material uh, as well. And then the material goes through the mesh and it also goes through the holes to help lock in. But it still doesn't solve the issue that Marshall's been able to solve uh, on the second molar, and that is material wanting to kind of run out of the back of that because of gravity when we put that in the, uh, in the patient's mouth. So I don't know that there's a way to use a double arch tray and be able to achieve the kind of stop that Marshall has done here. Uh, so if you start to pay attention, watch your second molars that you impress and see if in fact on the distal you're having some issue either with pulls or voids, uh, some sort of noise on the distal because of the fact that gravity is pulling it back. And if so, just grab one of your trays. You've probably got a torch in the office already. Make a little room for it. You'll notice that when you try a stock tray in, you'll see the second molar bumping up against the side of this at times, and you'll know that you need to widen this a little bit. Like Marshall did, and then you can add a stop back here. He used triad. I suppose uh, you could use any old composite you had sitting around. It might be expensive, but... You know, you've got that C4 that you probably don't use all that often, a tube of that. Maybe it's even expired. You know, you could build this uh, uh, up with that. Maybe even try it into the patient's mouth to shape it real quick with a little bonding agent on there as a separator and then light cure it. And you're going to have your own easy-to-make kind of custom tray. It's also going to keep stuff from going down the patient's throat, which is kind of nice, too, uh, by confining that material on the distal. So uh, thanks to Marshall for giving us a nice little tip on how to make a quick and affordable chair-side custom tray for second molars. Thank you for that, Dr. D. All thanks go to Dr. Horvitz. All right, well, thank you to him. And now let's go to a segment we call Viewer Mail. This week's viewer mail comes to us from Dr. Dan Burkmeyer, and he writes, Hello Mike, you lectured to the Suffolk County Dental Society last year and I thought it was great. I've been sending my work to Glidewell for 10 years and I'm really surprised how happy I've been. <laughs> yeah, I'm 
<laughs> I think that's a compliment, right? I'm not sure. Thank <laughs> that's you, a, I think. It's a, uh, it's a combination of um, a compliment and an insult. It's a compliment. It's a <laughs> and actually, you know. Uh, or a backhanded Dan, compliment. I've been here for 13 years, and I'm surprised how happy I am. <laughs> so I kind, of, I kind of second that. So. Oh, anyway, that's back good. to the letter. Okay, he says, here's my question. I cement all my Bruxer crowns with final cement. I've used it for all PFMs, gold, and now Bruxer. As I can easily remove the crown if there is food impaction, a different patient complaint, or a root canal is needed shortly after cementation. Using Ceramer or Relyx forces me to have to cut off Bruxer if I need to retrieve the crown. I've had several debond, and when that happens, I re cement them with Relyx. My question is Is there any downside of micro leakage with Bruxer that is worse than with PFMs? Thanks for your help, Dr. Berkmeyer. Well, um, since people uh, at home watching this couldn't see how you spelled it, when she said final, it wasn't F-I-N-A-L, it was F-Y-N-A-L, the zinc oxide eugenol cement from Dense Ply Caulk, a cement that I haven't used in many years. I remember using it back um, in dental school, but haven't used it since. So it's got a little more than zinc oxide eugenol. It's actually polymer reinforced. So if you look at the powder, it's 80% zinc oxide and 20% methyl methacrylate. Interestingly, I looked it up because I hadn't used the cement in a while. Uh, if you look at the liquid portion of it, it's pretty funny. It's 85% uh, eugenol mm -hmm. and it's 15% olive oil. Also there's good a, on bread. There's actually <laughs> olive oil in this cement. So if, if you use it on an Italian like myself and the eyes light up, you'll know why because they've actually got some olive oil in there. Um, the good part about this cement is that it sedates the pulp because of the presence of the eugenol. Uh, but the bad things about it is that it's not a really strong bond. In fact, it, it won't bond to the Bruxer uh, at all, so you need good mechanical retention. But really the reason most people moved away from it was because it was soluble. And it, the reaction that takes place, it has to have water or moisture in place for the cement reaction that takes place once you mix it up and place the crown on. And for that reason, it's soluble and that reaction can actually go in the other direction. And you can lose some of the cement from around there, from around the edge at the margin. And that's one of the reasons, maybe a little bit with the film thickness, but the biggest reason it seemed like people moved away from it was the solubility. Now, it sounds like you're not really having any issues with it, and you bring up a good point. If you put a Bruxer crown on, and for some reason there's an open contact, or there's something else that you don't like about it, maybe the shade. With final, I'm not surprised that you can pop it off and do whatever you need to do, including root canals, as you suggested. But you're absolutely right. If you put it on with Ceramer or you put it on with Rely Excluding Cement, now you're into cutting off zirconia. And that's a painful process that I don't enjoy going through. So I, I hear what you're saying. As far as the micro leakage goes, um, micro leakage is bad whether it happens with zirconia or whether it happens with the PFM. There's really no difference in how bad um, it is. And I don't think you'd see any difference in micro leakage between the zirconia and the PFM as well. It just comes down to the solubility of the final FYNAL um, cement itself. But if it's working for you, and any time a crown comes off, then you go to the Ceramer or the Rely Excluding Cement and put it on with that, knowing you'll have to cut it off if something goes wrong, then, then I'm good with it. If it's working for you, you're not getting post-operative sensitivity and not that many are coming off, I say go for it, but the only things that bond to Bruxer, cements that bond themselves, are Ceramer and Relyx or other resin-containing cements when you use a zirconia primer like Z-Prime Plus or Monobond Plus. But Dan, if it's working for you, no really need to change. Maybe one day, you know, my dream is for a cement where we can put a Bruxer crown on and uh, maybe light cure it mm -hmm. or whatever we have to do. And then if we have to take the crown off two years later, we have an anti-curing light. This hasn't been invented yet. Okay. This is the one small problem with this dream of mine. <laughs> the anti-curing light uncures the cement and we just lift it right off. Um, but it's one of the reasons why I don't bond Bruxer, Dan, unless I absolutely have to. I will just cement it with Ceramer uh, because even, you do still have to cut it off, but at least it's a little easier to get off than if you bond it into place. So what you're doing is definitely a novel approach, you know, different than most of the dentists that I talk to, but if it's working for you, you could certainly argue it and it makes sense. So uh, go for it, keep doing what you're doing. And uh, just keep an eye on the micro leakage, and uh, hopefully those are the ones that come off, and you just re cement it with the permanent cement. So, um, in honor of that, I would like to give 
Dan, one of the reverse prep kits. Oh, I'm heading nice. out to the Texas Dental Association this week. We're doing a hands-on. We're going to talk about this and then sit down and actually do a hands-on course, um, which is a fun thing to do. And we're going to do it instead of just the regular way we used to do it. We're doing um, minimally prepped crowns. Okay. So for Bruxer restorations, 0.6 millimeters of reduction on this reverse preparation technique and one millimeter for Emac. So we'll be having a good time. I know you're not in Texas and you probably won't be there since it's limited to 20 and already sold out. So I'm going to send this out to you. Nice. And you will be the recipient of that. Sweet. Well, in addition to that, we I have actually a twofer. I got two prizes. One, of course, is the weekly photograph. Mm -hmm. Because, I mean, who wouldn't, right? I look like I'm being sassy there. Or <laughs> bossy. Something that ends with an S-Y. Right. And I look confused. As you should. Okay. And then, so we'll have that for you, Dan. And then also, you, Dr. D, complain all the time about my, one of my favorite gifts that we give out here at the Terrorside Live Show, and that's the 30-piece, not 100, not 50, not 500, but 30-piece puzzle. Right. And you say it's kind of boring and whatever. Well, we've really upped the ante now because this time, we've got you with a classic Chinook. Yes, that's a steelhead, but close. <laughs> <laughs> that's close. They're cousins. It's the same thing. It's not a salmon. It's a huge rainbow trout that's a steelhead. <laughs> wow, that's a copyrighted image of Michael C. Detola, DDS. Right. I can't believe you were able to get the rights to that. I don't know what you had yeah. to pay for that. but uh, Wow, that's fantastic. Mm -hmm. I want one of those. I hope there's more than one of those. Um, yeah, the 30-piece puzzle, I mean, it's more difficult than I remember you originally wanted to do a two-piece puzzle for the dentist because you said that, you know, the left piece and the right piece. piece. You could still go the other way with them, but right. Careful that's kind of cool. And yeah, it is really cool, and you can make up any sort of fish you want this to be. It's okay. Right, right. but it is Salmon, a steelhead. steelhead, whatever you choose. Um, but, and I also really like, it's beautiful background. This is what, British Columbia? Mm -hmm. Yes, the Skeena River in British Got Columbia. Got that right, so... All that matters. Right. Awesome. Well, that's awesome. I'd sign it, except it's not put together yet. Maybe I'll put it together and sign it, and that'll be. Don't an, let okay. him have Maybe the fun of the thirty pieces. He can put it together and then put it in the birdcage. Right. All right. I don't get it. Okay. We'll align it with the droppings. Oh, the nice. Yeah, Got it. It's okay. like an old newspaper. Mm -hmm. Wow. Any news? Yes. <laughs> Sometimes words just don't do a story justice. I think it's safe to say that this story about a man's toothbrush gun. Yes, you heard me correctly. Toothbrush gun is just one of those stories. Let's take a look. Here we go. Oh, it's not in English. No. No subtitles? Uh, unfortunately not. This was done on the cheap. Yes. So what, that's a, what looks to be a handgun. Right, with just scotch taped. And those bristles, oh, I Oh good, know. yeah, because it wouldn't work dry brushing. We need to get some paste on there. Right. <laughs> and do those squeeze from the bottom. Don't, I hate when people do that. Don't those bristles look a little orange? And, yeah, they do. Yeah. They do. I think that's the dog's toothbrush. He wasn't able to. Oh, Locked man. Locked and loaded. Here that's, we go. That's drama. Ugh. Oh. Gosh. <laughs> Looking wow. around. He acts like he's uh, discovered gold. Right. Why keep doing it? Because that's what it takes to be on a viral video. And perhaps. Did it sound like I said. No one else nope. Yep. I don't oh. see this. Is this. If this is Shark Tank, I don't see this as a viable no, commercial this, product. <laughs> I don't think anyone's going to... I do like what is... Oh, oh that's my favorite. <laughs> Starts to this choke. is kind of disturbing. Oh, good, it's yeah. over. Yeah. No, he had to turn it off because he started to choke. So, um, why? <laughs> I Again, I think just uh, an attempt to have a video that's seen maybe uh, a million times and uh, right, maybe be asked the, to come on. let's how many... He's at 734,000 okay. views. He's, he's, jump, he's getting close to that million mark. There was talk at Glidewell that we should have a viral video. Yeah. I don't remember when we went around the room, somebody going, how about a handgun with a toothbrush <laughs> attached to it? But now we know the kind of... That maybe that's what we should try to aim for next time. Well, we have the um, sledgehammer. We do. For the Bruxer test. Yes. We could put a toothbrush on that and then Andrew's head here, like Perfect. the toothbrush... And so the weight would come down and brush his teeth at the same time. I think we should try it. All right, we'll give that He's a try. He's not here today, so that's perfect. That's it. There you go. We'll sign well, him up for the, it. The sign-up sheet mysteriously has his right. name on it. Anything else? <laughs> yes. A biker recently caused quite the traffic jam on a busy highway in Spain. Apparently, the man's dentures flew out of his mouth when he sneezed, and he stopped on the road to look for them. Two police officers approached the man and ordered him on his way. Not sure if he ever found his teeth. So he was on a motorcycle. He was on a busy highway in Madrid and sneezed. Wit 
with a helmet on or without a probably without a helmet on, I guess by definition, right? Because with a helmet on, they would have choop, choop, uh, right. Back, right, maybe right back in, <laughs> no, but at well, least I there. Mean, I guess like a traditional motorcycle helmet would have that, but if he was wearing just like a different type, maybe I don't know. I hope he was wearing a helmet, hmm. but so then he stopped. Um, he stopped his bike and got off in the middle of traffic and tried to find his teeth. So he, if he was going, say, 40, 50 miles an hour with the Come flow on, of traffic. Come this is Europe. Let's be realistic here, okay? 40, 50, right. it's definitely faster, but okay. Well, right. well and just... he sneezes and it flies out and it's going to land yeah, behind him. Right. I mean, that's pretty dangerous to go around and turn around yeah. and look at that. You know what he needs to do? He needs to find a doctor who watched last week's Case of the Week. Uh-huh. We did the denture yep. on the locator attachments. And you can sneeze all you want. You can vomit. Not you can do anywhere. anything. It's not going to come out. Little yeah. story. Uh, my dad made my best friend a flipper when, yep. when he was young. And uh, his brother, his older brother, had knocked his front tooth out uh, with a rock. And Aww. one of the first times my best friend and I uh, experimented with uh, alcohol together, we weren't Ooh, wow. quite 21. This is getting good. We were okay. 12. No, okay. <laughs> we weren't quite 21. And he still had this flipper because he never got the permanent bridge. Right. And uh, anytime he would get sick, including this one time when oh, he gosh. drank too much, he'd throw up and it would go into the toilet when he threw up. Yeah. And he would have to dig through and get it back out Aww. again. And uh, I didn't realize back then what a, you know, how bad a flipper was compared to other things that he could have had in its place, like yeah. a Maryland bridge or you know sure. something with some sort of retention. Uh, but he just had this flipper that he wore around. So had I not had that experience, I would say there's no way somebody can sneeze and have their denture fly out. But I've seen it happen, sort of, right. with like a Technicolor sneeze when my friend right. got sick and the flipper definitely came out with it. So That's great. I've never really experienced anything like that. I did have a friend who had a flipper and she would just like try to gross people right, out. with her tongue. To put her yeah, tongue through that's it That's exactly whatever. what my friend would do. He of got course. Like that and the tooth would move yeah. up and down and girls would get grossed out but secretly. <laughs> because he did I, it with such panache. No, I, I don't think that's He was the world's the most truth. interesting fifth grade student. <laughs> it was impressive. All right, well, thank you for that. Oh, that about gosh. wraps it up for this edition of Chairside Live. On behalf of myself, Megan, the whole CSL crew, and everybody here at the lab, I want to thank you for your time and your continued commitment to quality dentistry. We'll see you on the flip side. This week's... Oh, sorry. <laughs> this week's boom, mail. <laughs> now we go to a segment we call, What Am I Doing? <laughs> and he writes, hello, Mike. <laughs> I can't do it. Why does that sound like I'm from the outback? And a teen in Japan gives new meaning to the term <laughs> high-powered toothbrush or something stupid. Like a Technicolor sneeze when my friend got sick and the flipper definitely came out with it. So. <laughs>